Hey, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Chris and I, I'm with Snap Labs. I'm going to be talking about uh, building a home lab in the cloud. So first off, a big thanks to, to B-Sides Philly. I'm really happy to be speaking here uh, for the first time and also actually attending for the first time, which is pretty surprising. Uh, I've given like five or six other B-Sides talks across the country, but lived in Philly for 10 years and haven't been here yet. So very excited to to be recording this talk and excited to you know see what everyone else has to pre present uh, on Friday. So just some background on myself before we get going. Uh, I started my cybersecurity career consulting for security risk advisors uh, here in Philadelphia. So I was doing mostly technical assessments. Uh, and then actually towards the end of my time there is when I co-founded Snap Labs. Then I went to do uh, a bit of internal red teaming at GlaxoSmithKline, and then a, a short stint as uh, a blue teamer on the security monitoring team at Susquehanna International Group. So, so far everywhere I've worked besides my own company has been a nice three-letter acronym company. Uh, so, like I said, I co-founded Snap Labs uh, with my other partner, Barrett, and what we do is we, we have a product uh, that helps you manage, customize, deploy lab environments, and it's all cloud-based, hence the talk. Uh, and I also do a lot of uh, customized lab builds there. So um, before going into you know, how to build a lab in the cloud and, and some of the things to know about it, uh, why have a home lab at all? So what we find uh, is that there, there are a ton of different kind of varied and specific use cases for having a lab environment. And there's really two, uh, two big use cases that we run across. One is, is research and development. So people that are looking to uh, develop and or test new tools, pen testing scripts, automated uh, IR tools, that sort of thing, or even setting up things like honeypots uh, to try to analyze more widespread internet activity or collect malware samples and that sort of thing. So that's pretty popular, you know, set up a lab for R&D. Uh, but by far the most popular use case for, for having a home lab is to have a training environment, a safe place to go and practice uh, your pen testing skills or, or learn about cybersecurity uh, defense. So from the offensive side there, um, that can be anything from simple web app testing to uh, some basic network pen testing, or even kind of more sophisticated real world pen tests or red teams involving Active Directory and more connected infrastructure. And then on the blue team side, you know, similar to your app pen testing, you can check out secure app configurations or you know, work with different uh, security software that you set up in your lab. You can set up appliances to uh, protect your home network like firewalls or, or pie hole to stop ads from getting displayed. Uh, and there are also some pretty cool open source projects um, that let you pull in uh, sample malicious data sets and use them, uh, pull them into a sim and then use them to practice detection engineering and, and threat hunting. Um, so yeah, home labs are quite popular and there's a lot of free and paid platforms out there that will you know, give you access to a lot of these types of things. And those are great. You know, I build one of them myself. But I think that also the, the actual building of the lab environments is really valuable as a learning opportunity. And I know personally, I certainly understand things way better when you know, I've gone through the pain of setting it all up. So just to, like, to give an example of that, you could either read a quick blog post on how to exploit some specific Active Directory misconfiguration and take advantage uh, of a group policy misconfig to own a system, or you can go through the whole setup of you know, building the Active Directory environment, launching other systems, connecting them, pushing out configurations through GPO, and then attacking it. And for me, that's going to result in just a much more, uh, a much deeper understanding of what's actually going on with group policy um, from both the offensive and the defensive perspective. Same thing for for web apps, um, something we find is if you know you don't install software typically. I mean, sometimes unfortunately things are installed 
uh, default vulnerable. But most of the time, after you've done a fresh install of your favorite software or web application, it's going to be more or less secure. And to give yourself a vulnerable version of it for your lab, you have to figure out you know, what specific settings do I need to change to make this insecure and then go and attack them. So really the whole act of, of doing the lab build process, uh, I think is super important and a good way to, to really learn at a deeper level uh, what's going on. But I, I don't think you need too much convincing uh, that a home lab is a good idea if you're listening to this talk. So uh, we can go in and start actually talking about them. Uh, before talking about going into uh, the cloud for your lab environment, just want to go over some, some hardware constraints that you're going to run into like, as you get more sophisticated. So your basic lab is going to start off nice and simple, maybe just a, a single web app. And then as you learn, you might add more web apps to your lab environment, or you might be interested in just more sophisticated setups. So you know, while at first just running things off of your laptop is going to be fine for most people, as you progress throughout your career, you're probably going to run into a scenario where you're running something that's kind of too sophisticated for the device you already had, and you're going to have to start really thinking about investing in other hardware. So some, some quick examples of that kind of go through the, the chart of lab sophistication here. So a, a simple web application lab uh, is probably going to run on a single VM, or you could deploy it you know, in containers locally. It's not going to take up that much RAM or computer disk space or anything. And these are things like the OWASP juice, juice shop, uh, WebGoat, there are two open source projects from them that kind of focus on learning OWASP top 10 security issues. And then there's uh, intentionally vulnerable server or VMs as well, Metasploitable, then vulnerable Linux. These are all just single system isolated lab environments um, that would be fine to deploy on just probably your regular laptop. Now, as you move up from that, you're going to start having you know, a minimally networked lab. Think several Windows servers that talk to each other. Maybe you're running a, a web application on one of them that has a connection to a database on a different server. Now you're talking about having you know, more than just one system running on top of your host operating system. Uh, so you're dealing with more RAM requirements. You're dealing with you know, storage that you might have to think about depending on what applications you're running. Um, so you're probably still fine with a laptop, but you can start to see how, you know, as you add more and more systems that can get progressively more expensive. So a couple concrete examples of, of some open source projects out here and what their requirements are. Detection Lab, uh, we'll touch on later in this too, um, but the requirements for that are gonna be 55 gigs of hardware space, which I have free most of the time on my laptop, uh, but what I don't have is 16 gigabytes of RAM to spare uh, whenever. So this might be feasible on your, on you know your laptop or your your normal desktop, depending on your specs and what kind of work you do. But it's not for me, and I think for a lot of people, this is where you're going to start to need to think about getting that dedicated device. And same for Splunk Attack Range. This is another open source project uh, with a couple additional. It's very similar to Detection Lab, but you have some additional options in terms of uh, more Splunk services that you could launch. Um, so this definitely goes over the line for me of, I would need a dedicated desktop or server environment uh, to run this type of a lab on. So we, we started at the one end of the spectrum of just a single app, single system lab. Kind of the other end of the spectrum is similar to what you see um, in a lot of like the red team training courses out there, the lab environments they use for those, it's a, a full simulated corporate network. We have uh, several of these at Snap Labs. This is an example of the stats from our Shirts Corp lab. It's gonna have 28 virtual machines, over 60 gigabytes of RAM, close to a terabyte of storage. And you know, I don't personally know anyone with personal devices that can support that type of a lab environment. So you're probably gonna need a dedicated actual server to run this thing. Um, eventually, I think you know, if you play in lab environments long enough, you're gonna want something with this level of sophistication. Now, maybe you don't need 28 systems, but 
you might have 10 to 12, uh, which would still require most likely a, you know, a solid server set up to run reliably. And when you're talking about you know, the amount of money you could spend on that type of hardware versus the cost in the cloud, if you think of it in terms of your hours of usage, which you know, if you're taking advantage of the cloud properly and using its on-demand nature, um, that's how you should be thinking about it. How many hours am I gonna spend in this lab? It maybe starts to become worth it to think about a hardware setup for this type of environment if you're spending hundreds of hours a year in this lab environment, which I don't know about you, but I definitely don't have time for hundreds of hours on top of you know, my regular work just in a lab environment. So switching to the cloud for these types of things gives you a lot of flexibility. You can turn the lab off. You're only uh, using it, uh, you're only being charged for it when you use it. So some of the constraints of the hardware stuff um, onto transitioning to the cloud, we talked about it's on-demand nature. Um, another big advantage is aside from the, the on-demand nature is that there's no upfront costs either. So you can start off for free and kind of invest more money into your labs um, as you grow and as you decide that that's something you want to do. You don't have to decide upfront, hey, I want to get this server to set up this lab and then you know find out that you're not actually using it that much and it was a big waste of money. Um, there's also a lot of existing tools to deploy these labs pretty quickly. Um, so Terraform, Ansible, uh, there's several others that'll help you deploy and configure systems in the cloud. Uh, they also have options to do that locally, but it certainly means that there's no advantage to sticking local uh, to have that type of automation. And then like I mentioned the scalability already, as you're getting more sophisticated, your labs can also get more sophisticated uh, and you don't have to purchase any hardware or upgrade anything. It's just ready for you in the cloud. Um, so also a, a note on the hardware that Amazon and Microsoft is running, it's going to be much better than the hardware that you're able to purchase and, and you know, manage as a consumer. In, in most cases, they're gonna um, manage the updates of that. So if you had to switch out some RAM because it went bad, they're doing that for you. All of your data is pretty much backed up. Um, so I, I really recommend taking advantage of those aspects of, of the cloud for your lab environments. Another thing that's not necessarily just lab uh, related is how relevant and kind of future-proof to use a cliche term right now, um, but enterprises, applications, all these new technologies are being built largely in the cloud and they're not gonna be moving away from that anytime in the near future. So by putting your lab environment in the cloud, you're able to learn these cloud native concepts and get your hands on some of specific cloud services, you know, relevant to security, AWS as guard duty, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, um, there's Azure Sentinel, there's hundreds of other services that you can learn. And uh, that knowledge is gonna be relevant for you for a long time. So those are the advantages of moving to the cloud. There's also some, some gotchas. I won't call them uh, disadvantages really because you know, things aren't moving back away from the cloud. So I don't think the fact that it's different from on-prem is a disadvantage. It's just something that you should be aware of when you're building these environments. Um, so the big one everyone thinks of is it's really easy to misconfigure a service in the cloud to be insecure. So you know, you're big Fortune 100 company that leaves an S3 bucket public and then all of a sudden they have a huge data breach. That can happen when you're setting up your lab environments as well. So it's something to take note of. And then also the, the networking intricacies can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, so things that you might expect to just work as you're setting these things up for the first time won't. For instance, your broadcast traffic isn't gonna exist in the same way. Uh, Amazon is doing some special layer two magic where you're never going to see that. So tools like Responder won't work. And then kind of in the same vein, um, a lot of your network traffic analysis tools aren't going to work the same. So while you can, you know, TCP dump or do a packet capture off of an individual uh, network interface on an instance, you can't kind of 
uh, tap a switch in the same way you would in a physical lab to get all of the lab traffic and then monitor that through a tool like Zeek or Suricata. Um, AWS is doing things to make this uh, a little better. So they have things like VPC traffic mirroring, which will mirror all the traffic from those interfaces to a specific location, uh, but they don't support all the traffic types yet. And it's definitely not a one-to-one -one of what you're used to in a physical lab environment. Uh, so just some things to, to take note. Alrighty, on to building a lab in the cloud with AWS. So just, I'm gonna breeze through these steps real quickly here, um, but this is an example of what you'd need to do to get signed up and spin up a quick lab environment. So sign in or sign up if you haven't, create some underlying infrastructure that's mostly gonna support your networking, launch your systems, configure those systems, and then you know, start doing your pen testing or your blue team research or whatever you're doing. So to sign up just takes a couple of minutes. You'll need a credit card and a phone number, I believe, to verify your identity. And then when you go to the VPC service, I'd use this VPC wizard. Uh, select the first configuration here. If you're just starting out, it's going to give you a few things to take note of. Uh, you can name your VPC and set up the CIDR ranges. Uh, and this option is going to create a public subnet, which creates an internet gateway to allow you to actually have your systems in the lab to have internet access, which is important if you want to download software or tools and that sort of thing. Um, so it's going to also create a few other resources for you, DHCP options uh, for custom DNS or Active Directory domain things. The route table we'll talk about later is going to be important for both internet access uh, and your VPNs that you set up if you have them. And then the network ACLs, which we never touch because it's super easy to, to mess that up and then just lose access to your lab and not really know why things aren't talking to each other. Um, so once you do that, you're going to want to edit that route table. And I, I mentioned that it creates an internet gateway for you. If you selected that public subnet option, you're going to route all of the traffic bound for the internet at 0000, 000, 000 to that internet gateway. And that'll let your lab systems uh, talk to the internet and download software. Next, you're gonna launch your systems, your instances, select a, a service tier, how much RAM and compute do you need? Um, you're going to configure its details, make sure you put it in the right VPC. You should only have one subnet at this point if you're following along. Um, and then the important one here is the auto assign public IP address, that's going to give your instance a public IP and let it talk through that internet gateway, but it won't actually be accessible to the internet unless you configure your security group that way. Uh, so no worries there. Next, you add your storage, uh, add some tags, definitely recommend naming things so you know uh, what to go look for in your AWS account besides just instance IDs. And this is probably the most important step out of the seven here is to configure your security groups. Um, so in general, you want to definitely make sure that you're only allowing traffic to the traffic types that you need. So SSH or RDP and maybe web traffic or something if you have applications you need to access and generally selecting my IP uh, from the source list is going to be the safest and you know, only allow that, uh, that traffic from your current IP address. You also want to make sure that you allow the systems to talk to each other. So you know, we call this like an inbound local security group of letting anything that's in the VPC talk to anything else in your VPC. So that'll save you a lot of headaches down the line. And finally, we have uh, your key pair, which is going to be important for getting your passwords and SSHing into you know, getting your Windows passwords and SSHing into your Linux systems. All right. So Kind of a lot of steps there. It's kind of tedious to go through, especially when you have to do that, you know, 20, 25 times for each system. There are existing open source labs uh, with a lot of automation that'll help you go through that a lot quicker. So one of them is Detection Lab, which we talked about a bit. Um, this is a great project by Chris Long. And all you need to do is install the prerequisites, run your Terraform apply, 
and the scripts in there are going to automatically spin up most of that infrastructure we just talked about um, with pre-configured um, images on Amazon. So this takes roughly 20 minutes to deploy to AWS if you have your AWS set up um, with access keys and that stuff already. And there's also local options too for deployment. So these are the systems in that project. There's a, a Windows domain controller a server to do event collection and log forwarding, a simulated workstation, and then an Ubuntu server uh, for the actual Splunk and log ingestion and some other services. Splunk also has kind of a, a similar project called Splunk Attack Range. There's some great documentation there as well uh, on getting your AWS account set up. There's a few things you need to add uh, before you deploy this one. And it also uses Terraform to deploy to the cloud and this is the architecture for it. Um, so the main difference here between this and Detection Lab, as far as the deployment process goes, is that uh, Ansible is going to actually configure and build all these systems from scratch after Terraform deploys just the base operating systems. So Detection Lab has images pre-configured for you already, and they just deploy and are ready to go. And Splunk Attack Range will deploy the base, base OS and then configure it afterwards. So just a couple extra steps means it takes a little longer, maybe 30 minutes or so, uh, but still much quicker than doing this all on your own and then configuring it. So there, there's another lab here um, that ran by my Twitter feed a while ago that I wanted to include uh, just as kind of an alternative that's very similar. They focus on um, identifying and sharing indicators of compromise. So the logging is pretty extensive, but the, the main difference with this one is it's Azure specific and it doesn't use Splunk as its SIM. It uses a project called Helk, which is the hunting elk stack. Uh, so it's all open source tools uh, to let you kind of do the same thing as Splunk, just a bit different. All righty. So no matter how you've set up your lab environment, the next thing that you're going to need to do is access it. And you know the, the security group setup, as I mentioned before, is really important to make sure that you're not opening up you know, RDP to the internet from everywhere and that sort of thing. So I think really the best option for this is to set up a separate software VPN to access the rest of your lab environment. It kind of simplifies some of the other security group setup that you have to do and also keeps it super secure. You know, the only thing accessible to known IP addresses is gonna be a few ports on one system. And then that is kind of your bastion host for everything else in the lab. So setting up several VPN solutions over the years with Snap Labs, it's, it definitely can be a pain and uh, you know, maybe a barrier for some folks that are just getting started with building their lab environments. Uh, so we decided that we can remove that barrier by taking the solution we built for our platform and open sourcing a good part of it uh, in the Snap Labs Bastion box to allow some VPN connection, easy cert management, creation, revoking, uh, and also a super convenient feature to access your systems through the browser, even without a VPN client, uh, using Apache Guacamole. So to set up the Bastion box, um, First, you have to have your lab set up in the cloud. Uh, then you just launch uh, the Bastion box uh, into that lab environment. There's a public AMI that's available to you that you can just search for uh, in the community AMIs in Amazon, log in. At it. When you set it up initially, your instance ID is gonna be your password, and then you can connect to your systems. There's also some optional Bastion box settings so if you disable the source and destination check on that system and also add a route for the VPN clients, which there's documentation for in the GitHub as well, that'll let you have C2 callbacks to connected clients to the VPN, which can be important. And also if you assign an elastic IP to it, that'll make sure that any existing VPN configurations will live through any power cycles. Otherwise, when you power off and on that instance, um, you'll get a new external IP each time. Now, this is what uh, the console looks like. It's a pretty simple interface. You can connect to and edit, create console sessions, download, revoke, create new VPN configurations. 
Um, and I should mention also that this is not limited to AWS. So you can do this, um, deploy this in your local lab environments as well with a, an install script. So for console sessions, there's a, a few simple uh, configuration settings to make. Same for VPC, VPN configurations. Uh, and now we can walk through all that. Okay, so when you launch this, you'll be presented with just a, a login screen. And like I said, uh, the password is going to be the instance ID of the instance, the bashing box instance that you launched. So you can just sign in and then you can see you have access to all of your console connections here. You can edit existing ones, see what the parameters are. You can delete them in here as well, create new connections all super quick and simple. And then to connect, just select the icon under the connect row there and it forwards you, forwards this RDP connection straight through to the browser, which you know, I found super helpful, especially when you have a ton of systems to not have to manually RDP or SSH into each one of them when you make, want to make some config changes to your lab. Uh, same thing for the VPN configs. Uh, to create a new one, it's really easy. Just type in the name of it. Um, there's like two parameters that change based on whether you're running on Linux or Windows. Uh, so just select the appropriate one there, create it, download it. You can connect with any uh, VPN client that accepts OpenVPN configuration files and there's, there's plenty of those. And then if you don't want these to work anymore, you gave them to a friend and you don't want them to have access, you can just do a simple revoke and that'll remove it from the server for you. All right, so that's it for Bastion Box and also our presentation. So I appreciate everyone uh, for you know, tuning in and watching this recording. I'm sure I'll be quite embarrassed uh, <laughs> listening to myself for 30 minutes, but I'll be in uh, the Snap Labs Discord channel uh, during the conference. Uh, I think Barrett will be there as well for any questions you have. And here are the links um, to some resources, including the Bastion box, and we'll get these slides posted to our website as well. Thanks a lot.